when uh, we came here, Alfonso, how many weeks ago was the camp meeting here? Do you remember? First weekend of September, and this is the second or first, the second weekend of November, so six weeks ago. When we came here six weeks ago, one of the things that we thought was workable with having this as a prophecy school was the food they prepared. Were we correct? Is yes. it, this is acceptable, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. How about the living accommodation? Um, while I'm thinking about that, I better leave this for later rather than the video. I have a phone number uh, for the telephone booth for if, if you call out and you need someone to call you back, I'll put it on the board after this meeting. This probably doesn't fit on this video presentation, but let's uh, begin looking at the next section of our study, which we call the purification of God's church. Um, but in, in reference to uh, this prophecy school, now I know for sure it was six weeks ago that we came across this place and decided to try to hold this prophecy school, and we knew that uh, we had to make it by invitation only, because if we put it on our mailing list and we got a good response, this isn't big enough for a, a super big crowd. And, uh, but in six weeks, there was a whole lot to do. And uh, one of the things that I had a lot of grandiose ideas that I would have wanted to do if I could have, and one of them was, is that there's a sister out in California that we know that she has a, um, a book of artwork by an artist, and I don't remember the artist's name. I know that the artist is a woman. I think she's probably still alive. She's a, a modern artist here in the United States. And this, what she, the type of art that she does, she does realistic um, landscape pictures, only they, they always include American Indians. Um, it's a combination of both the forest or the desert and Indians, where whatever she's doing, but she has a a trick within her artwork, and I had thoughts of contacting this friend of mine and saying, can I use your book that shows all this lady's different paintings and get some of it onto this PowerPoint presentation, but I never even tried. I knew I couldn't do it. But the reason for it is because this lady's artwork uh, fits into this subject in my mind and in this sense. When you, when you see one of these ladies' paintings, and Bud and Carol, uh, Maybe Kim showed you some of this. Kim Bathke is the one that has this uh, lady's artwork. But you look at a painting uh, of this uh, lady and you see forest, just solid forest. But you know who this lady is, so you know there's an American Indian in there or one or two, and you just keep looking and you look and you look. And at some point in time, you'll see a whole tribe of Indians going through the forest and suddenly you'll see even their ponies that are tagging along with them and it comes alive. But from that point on, if you look at that painting, you're going to see the Indians, the American Indians there. But I mean, it's very, very well done, but it illustrates a point in, in my mind that uh, <clears throat> we miss, unfortunately, is Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world and it's this point. The Sunday Law is the focus of end time Bible prophecy. And the Sunday law pervades the Bible from beginning to end. But because we don't realize that, we can read the Bible through and through and read right through passages that are dealing with the Sunday law. And we're going to deal with some of this in this study called the Purification of God's Church. And the reason that this subject is called the Purification of God's Church is because one of the many things that the Sunday law does is it is the tool that purifies God's church. Now that's not the only thing the Sunday Law accomplishes, but that's one of the things, and, and that's where the title comes from, and that's what it's all about. So this, once again, we're not at the point where we're uh, starting to systematically look at different passages of Scripture in a prophetic sense. This is still part of the foundation of a prophecy school. But this is where we we're going to attempt to set forth the correct sequence for end time events. And once we have that established, then we can better um, apply these passages of prophecy at the end of the world and make sure that they're following the right train of thought, train of truth. Um, Review and Herald, April 4th, 1893. 
Um, but many of you have been friends of mine for uh, several years here, some not very long. One brother, maybe more than one brother, but one brother I just met today for the first time. But the brother in here that uh, I've been with friends with longer, through the years, he and I have had a lot of differences of opinion, lots of things, and I'm not threatened by it. We get along well. But we had a little, a little discussion in the la line here at lunch, and he was pointing out, he couldn't quite remember where it was, a passage where um, he seems to believe that um, when we get to the Sunday Law time period, we're going to find out that our understanding of prophecy was incorrect, but, but that pro prophet, and I'm, I'm not trying to put thoughts into his words, I'm, this isn't his word for words, but that we're going to see that prophecy was fulfilled completely in agreement with the word of God, but we're going to realize that we really didn't have an understanding of it before we got there. And I know there's a certain amount of that that I even understand is true. There's a, none of us, I don't believe, are going to get to the point where we have foreknowledge of everything that's coming. But I think too often in Adventism, we emphasize that opinion against passages in inspiration such as this one. The events of the future will be discerned by prophecy and will be understood. One saying of this, I know this brother is a friend of mine, a, a well enough, a good enough friend of mine that I could say this up front right in front of him, so that's why I'm smiling. My apologies, I shouldn't do that. One saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. <laughs> Though no man knoweth the day nor hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is near. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. What's been revealed to us, we're required to know. Uh, there's, a, there's a phrase in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. We're gonna, we, we mentioned, I moved very quickly last night. Now that I look back, I should have spent a little bit more time with last night's presentation and finished off some of it this morning. But there's a phrase in the Spirit of Pro Prophecy that she uses a few places where she, she talks about the great and solemn events. One of the phrases she says, the great and solemn events which we must know. But she uses that phrase, great and solemn events, in different ways. The great and solemn events are the the things that are starting to take place right in front of our eyes. And she says, we must know those. We must know these great and solemn events. This quote here from the Great Controversy 594, um, to me, is a very important quote. This is one that means a lot to me. It says a lot of things. Um, it's speaking, if you go back in the Great Controversy, it's speaking in terms of Adventists not two people outside of Adventism. Primary focus of this statement is for Seventh-day Adventists. And it says, The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes have no, no more understanding of these important truths than if, if they had never been revealed. And uh, there's two points here that Sister White, two uh, um, perspectives that Sister White brings up in several of her statements, I, I think you can find these two um, perspectives throughout the Bible as well once you look for them. End time Bible prophecy deals with two things. It deals with the events, the historical events, the way marks uh, that lead to the close of probation. And it also deals with the need of preparation of each and every one of us in this room. It's two things. End time Bible prophecy teaches what the events are, and it also brings the message that you and I need to prepare to stand during a time when there's no longer any intercession for sin. But most of us have no more understanding of either the events or our need of preparation. It's as if it's never been revealed. And let me ask you a question, a little, little bit beyond, uh, I don't really need to take this much time with this quote, but where would you say the clearest picture is of the events that lead to the close of probation in God's Word. Daniel 11, 40-45. The events that lead up to the time when Michael stands up. What is this saying to us? These events, multitudes have no more understanding of Daniel 11, 40-45 than if it had never been revealed. 
And certainly it's been revealed. If these are the events that lead to the close of probation, what does the Bible teach? The Lord thy God will do nothing except he reveal it through his servants, the prophets. So these verses in Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the more you look at them, when you first look at them, they seem, boy, this is pretty deep, this is pretty confusing. But the more you look at them, the more you realize, hey, this is simple. This is, this is upheld in this part of the scripture and this part of the scripture. Um, it's just that we haven't been looking. That we're, that's my conviction. So, we're beginning into uh, our study of the purification of God's church, and we're suggesting to you that the very focus of this study and of Bible prophecy is the Sunday Law, and prophecy is portrayed on a, a line, a delineation of events, and the line goes to the end of the world, and I'm suggesting to you here that this way, Mark, on this timeline going to the end of the world, is the Sunday Law. And we're going to break up some of these events on what leads up to the Sunday Law, what takes place at the Sunday Law, what takes place after the Sunday Law. Uh, I know many of you have, have listened to the study we do called The Purification of God's Church. That's nine parts, and there's no way that I think that I understand all about it, but it's nine hours. We're going to go through this in a couple presentations, so this is... I'm not suggesting that we're going to hit every way mark before and after, but we're going to try to hit many of them. First point that I would want to set forth here is from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 977. A time is coming when the law of God is in a special sense to be made void in our land. The rulers of our nation will, by legislative enactments, enforce the Sunday law, and thus God's people will be brought into great peril. When our nation in its legislative councils shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to the religious privileges enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath, the law of God will to all intents and purposes be made void in our land and national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. The Sunday law that fulfills Bible prophecy is twofold. If they pass a Sunday law in the Congress tomorrow that says we can't buy gasoline on Sunday, that is a Sunday law, but that is not the Sunday law that fulfills Bible prophecy. The Sunday law that fulfills Revelation 13, 11, when the United States speaks as a dragon, is the Sunday law where you are forced to observe Sunday and persecuted for keeping Sabbath. And that is the Sunday law that we are dealing with in this study. That's, I'm defining right here at the outset set what what I'm understanding as a Sunday law from here on out. It's this twofold Sunday law. Now, I understand from inspiration, and I agree with, that there will be an escalation of Sunday legislation that leads to this Sunday law. I'm just not, I'm defining the one that draws the line in the sand that is the fulfillment of the full maturity of the image of the beast in the United States. Uh, and the one where probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists, but we will deal with that as we move forward. Uh, you see the wind then up there on the screen. I don't know if you've ever noticed this principle before. It's really beneficial when you're reading the Spirit of Prophecy. Oh, there are several, several passages where Sister White will have a paragraph or even a sentence, sometimes even more, and within the paragraph she'll say, when this happens, when this happens, when this happens, when this happens, and then she will say, then this happens. And when you start looking for the when and the then in the spirit of prophecy, you'll start realizing that she's identifying when this historical event takes place and this historical situation arises and this historical event takes place, then this happens and suddenly you realize she's being very specific about when this certain thing is going to take place. So it's, it's worth taking note of. If you haven't ever noticed it before and you begin looking for it, you'll see that she speaks in those terms often in her writings. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 388. When the law of God has been made void and apostasy becomes a national sin, the Lord will work in behalf of His people. The Lord working in behalf of His people takes place after the Sunday law. Is the Lord working in behalf of His people today? Yes. 
We're talking the work that the Lord uh, identifies with the loud cry message, the latter rain, the, the angel of Revelation 18 coming down. This is a specific work um, that prophecy points to that gets underway at the Sunday Law. The people of the United States have been a favored people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, and give countenance to popery, the measure of their guilt will be full, and national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. Uh, national apostasy is a, a term to, to follow in your mind. Um, there are many things going on in this time period. And one of the things that's taking place is at the Sunday Law in the United States, the Sunday Law has filled up the cup of its iniquity. And uh, we're told that first the United States does that, and then every country on the globe follows in the example of the United States. So one of the prophetic themes that, that goes through this history is that the nations are filling up the cup of their iniquity. And national apostasy follows national ruin, not only with the United States, but with any country that uh, enters into that principle. With rapid steps, we are approaching this period when Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to sustain a false religion for opposing which their ancestors endured the fiercest persecution. Then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. There will be a national apostasy which will only end in national ruin. Now, what's she talking about? She's talking about the Sunday Law. And one of the things she just said is that when this time period is reached, um, national ruin. And th this may seem, we are, we're all familiar with this. She says this in several places. And this may seem mundane or insignificant. Um, pro it probably doesn't, but possibly. But for me, there are many things that are identified prophetically that begin to take place at this time period. And one of them is national ruin, and it's escalating. Virtually, virtually everything that we're going to deal with as we move forward here needs to be understood as progressive. There's a, there's a progression of all the prophetic things. I should, probably shouldn't say all, but most of the prophetic things that we're going to mention, they're progressive. They're escalating. Um, even the Lord's work during this time is escalating. Sister White defines the loud cry as a, a message that grows bigger and stronger. It's escalating. But one of the things that's escalating during this time period is national ruin. And there's other things that are escalating with it, and when we pay attention to those, we begin to see the environment that's taking place during the loud cry, latter rain time period, and even before it, as we um, continue to identify these waymarks. In Evangelism 134, have you ever thought that the Sunday Law test was a sign? The answer is yes. Seventh-day Adventists know that the Sunday Law is a sign, right? Based on what? What does Sister White say? When, when, when the Sunday Law arrives in the United States, it's a sign of what? Time to leave the larger cities to the smaller cities, based on Matthew 24, 15. We'll deal with that later, but it's a sign, among other things. A, a prophetic sign, the Sunday Law is. It is at the time of the national apostasy, when acting on the policy of Satan, the rulers of the land will rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. It is then that the measure of guilt is full. The national apostasy is the signal for national ruin. So the Sunday Law is a sign, a signal. And uh, the history of the Sunday Law being a sign has been prefigured by the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, that's, that's what we're speaking about. So if we want to understand the, the history that transpires before and after and during the Sunday Law, it's, it's worthwhile to understand the history of the Jews during AD 70. And what, we, what was happening? What was one of the histories that was happening? I might be getting ahead of myself here. One of the things that was happening in the destruction of Jerusalem is that God was separating His people. There was... His people that had formerly been his, in his people stayed in Jerusalem and were destroyed with Jerusalem. But at that very time, what was he doing? He was taking out his new people, the Christians, and not one of them perished 
in the destruction of Jerusalem. There was a separation going on during that time period, and we know that that time period had a sign connected with it that pointed forward to the Sunday Law. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 451. As the approach of the Roman armies was a sign to the disciples of impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy be a sign to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached. Let men beware lest they ne neglect the lesson conveyed to them in the words of Christ. Now the words of Christ were to the Christians of that day and age, but she's saying we need to beware of neglecting that warning. As he warned his disciples of just Jerusalem's destruction, giving them a sign of the approaching ruin that they might make their escape, so he has warned the world of the day of final destruction and has given them tokens of its approach that all who will may flee from the wrath to come. Jesus declares there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations. Those who behold these harbingers of his coming are to know that it is near even at the doors. Watch ye, watch ye therefore are his words of ammunition. They that heed the warning shall not be left in darkness that the day should overtake them unawares but to them that will not watch. The day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. This is a repeat of history. The Sunday law is a repeat of what went on with the destruction of Jerusalem. And to not look for the signs is to be left in total darkness. And who is it that's left in total darkness in our day and age? Well, it's the, the clear illustration of that is who was left in total darkness at the beginning of Adventism because the beginning of Adventism illustrates the end of Adventism. And who was left in total darkness at the beginning of Adventism? The foolish virgins. And the parable of the ten virgins is fulfilled again to the very letter. And what, left, what leaves the foolish virgins in total darkness here at the end? They refuse to look for the signs. That's how I read that passage. Uh, well, let's, let's go to the next close. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 154. This is one of the scariest quotes in inspiration, in my mind. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the world. And those that have had great light and opportunities. In the spirit of prophecy, who is it that's had great light and opportunity? Seventh-day Adventists. Easy to establish. Those who have had great light and opportunities and have not improved them will be the first to be left. They have grieved away the Spirit of God. The present activity of Satan in working upon hearts and upon churches and nations should startle every student of prophecy. The end is near. Let our churches arise. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that the Sunday Law is, now I intended, I'm not going to do it. I, I just now remembered that I intended to do this, but it's not worthwhile anyway. So don't anybody go run for it. I intended as we go, went through this study, there are several studies that we have done in the past that we're incorporating into this particular study. And some of them we're just going to touch on them briefly, and I intended to take right now um, the tape study that we call, have called the Judgment of the Living and tell you right here and now that if you want to um, look closer at the point we're dealing with that we have more information in the Judgment on the Living series. So I've just told you anyway. But the Judgment of the Living, uh, I didn't need to show it to you. The Judgment of the Living is a study that takes the time to show that judgment is progressive. And there's many in Adventism that haven't understood this, and there's some people that have looked at it and oppose it. But judgment is definitely progressive. All these things are progressive, and we know it's progressive as Seventh-day Adventists. We're just not willing to take it to its complete understanding. If you ask a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, does the judgment begin with the dead and go to the living? They say yes, it's progressive. It's progressive, it begins with the dead, and at some point in time it goes to the living. We know it's progressive. But when it comes down to the Sunday law, many of us are unwilling to say that yes, in the progression of the judgment, there comes a time where those who have had great light and opportunities but have not improved them, that they're left in total darkness. 
And it's at that point in time that the church is purified and those who have improved their opportunities receive the seal of God. And those that are in the total darkness receive the mark of the beast. And those that receive the seal of God receive also the latter rain and they begin to proclaim the loud cry message which has come out of Babylon. And God's other children of Babylon respond to that call and judgment moves forward and those of God's other children that are still in Babylon, they are then tested by what? The Sunday law test. And what are they making their decision upon? See, you and I, we're basing up our decision upon the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That's not what they're making their decision upon. It's the Sunday law test for them, but what are they making their decision upon? They're making the decision upon seeing the character of Christ in these people that have received the seal of God. And we're going to look at a quote. It clearly says that. Our test is different than the world, but judgment is progressive. It's progressive. And here at the Sunday law, Sister White has a statement, I know you're all familiar with it, where she says, No man knoweth the day or the hour that the judgment of the living begins. Please don't leave here and say that I'm teaching that the judgment of the living begins at the Sunday law. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is this, that at the Sunday law, you as a Seventh-day Adventist living in the United States, if you're alive, we will either receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God. And when that time arrives, we know we're in the judgment of the living. I'm not saying that it starts right then. It probably starts well before that. I'm not putting a date on it. But when we get to this time period, the judgment of the living is underway. Judgment is progressive. It begins with the dead. It goes on in the living. And at some point in time, uh, it comes to a conclusion when Michael stands up. Judgment is progressive in another sense. The tool that the Lord uses to bring judgment to the close is the Sunday law test. This is, this is the issue that he uses to bind up the wheat and the tares. That's the issue. It's progressive. And because of that, we know from inspiration that the Sunday law test begins where? In the house of God. Judgment begins in the house of God. That's not the question that I, or the answer I was looking for. But where does the Sunday law begin? The United States. And in every country on the globe follows its example. The Sunday law test, as the tool that brings judgment to a close, is progressive geographically as well. But, for those of you that are from England and Germany and Switzerland and uh, there's one other country, Malaysia, the final movements are rapid ones. Our probation may close here uh, on one day. It doesn't mean that you've got, and Mexico and many uh, other, and Venezuela, uh, months of time, particularly in the Latin countries, I think... Uh, when Protestant America falls, Catholic Latin America falls very quickly. Um, not one Christian perished in the de destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had given his disciples warning, and all who believed his words watched for the promised sign. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, said Jesus, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. After the Romans under Cestius had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. Let, let's remember that. Put that in the back of your mind. We already know it, but I want to place it in the back of your mind because I want to say something afterwards. Jerusalem surrounded, there's the sign, he withdraws. The besieged, despairing of successful resistance, were on the point of surrender when the Roman general withdrew his forces without the least apparent reason. But God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of his own people. The promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians, and now, ha now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the Savior's warnings. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Upon the retreat of Cestius, the Jews, sallying from Jerusalem, pursued after the, his retiring army, and while both forces were thus fully engaged, the Christians had opportunity to leave the city. At this time, the country also had been cleared of enemies who might have endeavored to intercept them. At the time of the siege, the Jews were assembled at Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and thus the Christians...
throughout the land were able to make their escape unmolested. Without delay, they fled to a place of safety in the city of Pella, in the land of Perea, beyond Jordan. Now, I've had opportunity to deal with this history prophetically with Seventh-day Adventists because there's two passages um, where Sister White refers to this history and she, she deals with it in terms that uh, is significant to uh, those of us in Adventism today. I want to make sure that uh, my notes here. And what, what she, what we were all familiar with these two quotes. She says, as the sign of, this sign we're dealing with was a sign of the Christians during the time period of the destruction of Jerusalem, so the Sunday law is a sign for us uh, to flee the cities uh, just prior to going to the larger cities. Now, my take on this, and she quotes Matthew 24, 15. My understanding of this, and I, I've shared this many times, is this. That's one of the most misunderstood quotes in Adventism. Because at least by 1901, Sister White clearly says, out of the cities, out of the cities, out of the cities. This is my message. Since 1901, she's been saying the message is, out of the cities, out of the cities, out of the cities. So as Adventists, we say, no, all I have to do is wait to the Sunday law, and then I know it's time to leave the cities. And my response to that has been that we need to go back and read Matthew 24, 15. Uh, this was the very last opportunity for Christians to get out of Jerusalem. The Sunday law is the very last opportunity to get out of the cities. Now recently, I was up in Idaho, and the brethren up there were telling me about a pastor and I was telling someone here recently, they know who he is, you can help me with this, a pastor that has went into self-supporting work, I think it was Sister Jackie, from up in the Idaho, Washington area. Was it, maybe it wasn't you, someone has to know his name here. What's his name? The pastor that's, that's doing work, you said you're getting his tapes. He's coming doing a big series on country living down in Los Angeles. David Westbrook. I've never heard him, but I've been hearing things about David Westbrook. And one, supposedly the brethren in Idaho are sending me uh, his presentation on this subject. And as they told me his presentation, without hearing it, I agree with him. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. He, he's caught. He's, he's nailed something down. And what he nails down, he goes back into the A.T. Jones 1888 time period and he deals with the Sunday law crisis then. And he nails that down and says, there was the warning to leave the cities. And then he points out that immediately after, Sister White is saying, out of the cities, out of the cities. So what's going on since that time period? The armies have withdrawn. The warning took place back in the first Sunday Law crisis in Adventism. And that's absolutely consistent with the history of Matthew 24, 15. So brothers and sisters, and I know some of the brethren here are living in London and Los Angeles, and let me look around. Uh, and there's some other cities that, you know, Frank, I don't know if I can really say you're living in Frankfurt, are you? You're probably outside of Frank, is it Frankfurt? No, okay. But we need to be out of the cities. We need to be out of the cities for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the brethren that were living in the cities that visited our home for just a couple days prior to this meeting, when you stepped outside at night, was there a difference? in the noise you were hearing outside at night compared to the noise you were hearing outside your door. Uh, the daytime's even different, isn't it? Um, we need to be in the country. Um, for a lot of reasons. For a lot of reasons. It is no time now for God's people to be fixing their affections or f laying up their treasures in the world. <clears throat> the time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate places desolate and solitary places, as the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was a signal for the flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree of enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning, in us, warning to us. It will be then time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. I haven't heard the tape, but I think the brother is correct that the sign took place at the first Sunday Law Crisis. It's consistent with, with how I, I read Matthew 24, 15. Westbrook. Westbrook. Yeah, he, he does say that, that, right? 
Councils on Health, page 232, out of the cities, out of the cities. This has been my message for years. If, if memory um, on this is correct, that was 1901. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of an allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly power, received the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, received the seal of God. Brothers and sisters, at the Sunday law, we either received the mark of the beast or the seal of God. Period. And she says it all over the place. And, and you stand up and say that in Adventism today, and there's people, they don't, they don't want to say that. But, you know, maybe there's, there's a little bit more time somehow, some way after the Sunday law. It isn't that way. Now, there is, there is a caveat, if that's the right word, to that, and that's if we've had light on Sabbath and Sunday. If we're, we haven't had light on Sabbath and Sunday, then when the Sunday law arrives, are we held accountable for that test? No. But are Seventh-day Adventists going to be held accountable for that light? Yes, because when it comes to judgment, we are judged by light, and we're not judged simply by the light that we have. We're judged by the light that we could have had if we would have availed ourselves. And I've had people tell me more than once, and I think their logic is sound. They say, you know, I, anymore I believe there's Seventh-day Adventists in the church that do not understand Sabbath and Sunday. And I say, yeah. I agree with you. So, some places I've been and I, and I see, you know, who's getting baptized by who and what kind of studies they had before they were baptized. I believe that's probably true, but they're going to be held accountable for the light that they accepted when they came into the membership of God's church. That's my understanding. Let the Lord be the judge. But in terms of those of us that aren't in that possible exception to the rule. You and I are going to be held accountable if we're alive and the Sunday law comes. I'm sure of it. What the mark means. The time has come for the true light to shine amid moral darkness. The third angel's message has been sent forth to the world, warning men against receiving the mark of the beast or of his image in their foreheads or in their hands. To receive this mark means to come to the same decision as the beast has done, and to advocate the same ideas in direct opposition to the Word of God. I don't know what you were thinking when you were hearing Russell this morning, so I don't know if, you know, my thoughts, I can't know if they're any, anything like yours, but he was making some statements about, and we come up to the 1840 time period, and there's a group of people, and they're carrying the beast. They're carrying the woman. They're carrying the woman. They're the beast. And for me, I'm, I'm understanding him. I agree with him. And he, he mentioned it, but he didn't, I don't know that he spent a great deal of time to nail down his definition. He's saying they're carrying the woman in their hearts and in their minds. They have the doctrines of Rome, and they're carrying her. They're carrying them with him. And this is consistent with the, the bottom line of what the mark of the beast and the seal of God is all about. To receive the mark of the beast means to come to the same decision, have the same thoughts, the same mind as the woman as the beast. And if I'm carrying the doctrines of Rome in my mind and my heart, I'm carrying Rome. Okay, that's how I understood what he was saying. And he will, you'll have to explain if that's important to you, whether I'm understanding it right or not tomorrow. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. The contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Notice the progression, step by step. There's a progression going on today, brothers and sisters. Every choice you and I are making today is either weakening us or strengthening us to stand in the Sunday Law time period if we're alive when it hits. It's a progression. And here, those of us in Adventism that are walking the walk of worldly conformity 
when the Sunday law hits, our spiritual strength will be empty. Empty. Notice this step-by-step progression. Said the angel, deny self, you must step fast. Some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step. And every step we've taken has given us strength to take the next. But now time is almost finished. And what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. Those who would not receive the mark of the beast in his image when the decree goes forth must have decision now. To say, nay, we will not regard the institution of the beast. I mean, if you want to technically analyze the English grammar of that paragraph, and believe me, I know you all realize the English language is not a strong suit for me, but I still can analyze the definition of those words. She's saying the people that aren't going to receive the mark of the beast at the Sunday law, they better be saying no now. And if they're not saying no now, they're going to receive the mark of the beast. There's two, two walks going on in Adventism. Two walks going on in Adventism. One's the step-by-step -step walk towards the world, and the other one's the step-by-step -step growing up in the strength of the Lord to stand during that testing time. End time events are progressive. These walks are going on on this side of the Sunday law at this time as we speak. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, 422. But no one is made to feel the wrath of God until the truth has been brought in contact with his mind and conscience and has been rejected. There are many in the churches of our country who have never, even in this land of light and knowledge, had an opportunity to hear the special truths for this time. The obligation of the fourth commandment has never been set before them in its true light. Jesus reads every heart and tries every motive. The, the decree is not to be urged upon the people blindly. Everyone is to have sufficient light to make his decision intelligently. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth, especially controverted. The test is progressive. The Sunday law is the dividing line. At the Sunday law, we receive either the mark of the beast or the seal of God, with the exception of those people who have never understood Sabbath and Sunday, the light on those two issues. And their testing time is underway. And it continues until Michael stands up and human probation closes. Um, now, this time period that we're setting, we're marking off here, there are many prophetic symbols, many prophetic themes that run through this time period. But one of them I want to point to here is that here is where the door closes on the foolish virgins in Advent. It closes on all the virgins in Adventism, for foolish and wise. Here's where the door closes for God's people. Here's where the door closes for all men. And you have to factor into that as well that the test is geographic. So you also have um, United States, this country, this country, this country. And certainly the world death decree, the Sunday law, that, where it all is brought together. But it's progressive. With the issue clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. The warning from heaven is, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Revelation 14, 9 and 10. If the light of truth has been presented to you, revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, this is one of my favorite. I should have said that before I started. Um, it was, it was one of my favorite. I mistaken. You, if you listen to some tapes of mine, I, have, I was in error on how I portrayed this passage for quite some time. And then uh, I think it was a sister wrote in to me and, and she says, you know, uh, I think the evidence is, is that the editors of the Review and Herald that put this article in there, 
that they're the ones that put the italics in it. Because for a long time I was saying, you know, here's a passage from Sister White, and she italicized certain parts of the paragraph to emphasize the point. And the, the sister corrected me, and I think she's right. It wasn't Sister White that italicized these parts. The editors of the Review and Herald italicized them. But it, but it doesn't matter. The editors see what I see. There is a, a specific... Um, emphasis in this passage of what Sister White is trying to say. She's trying to be very clear. It's right here that you receive the mark of the beast, and it's right here that you receive the seal of God. And the editors thought, well, you know, if we italicize these questions, uh, everybody will even see it clearer. So with that being said, I'm doing a, um, a retraction on all those tapes that may have went far and wide, but it didn't change the message at all. So let's read this. If the light of truth has been presented to you, revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and showing that there is no foundation in the word of God for Sunday observance, and yet you still cling to the false Sabbath, refusing to keep holy the Sabbath, which God calls my holy day, you receive the mark of the beast. When does this take place? When you obey the decree that commands you to cease from labor on Sunday and to worship God, why you know there is not a word in the Bible showing Sunday to be other than a common working day, you consent to receive the mark of the beast and refuse the seal of God. If we receive this mark in our foreheads or in our hands, the judgments pronounced against the disobedient must fall upon us. But the seal of the living God is placed upon those who keep conscientiously keep the Sabbath of the Lord. Now, the reason that I put so many quotes in there about Sabbath and Sunday is because in Adventism, believe it or not, believe it or not, there's many of us that will argue that it's all over probationary-wise at the Sunday Law. They somehow think at the Sunday Law test, as Seventh-day Adventists, we still have more time. But that's not what inspiration teaches and it's not simply Sister White that teaches this. I mean, she's very crystal clear. But if you're going to be fair about passages like the parable of the ten virgins and correctly align them at the end of time, the door closes on the virgins at some point in time. And uh, it's clear when you take that history and bring it down to the end of the world. That point in time is the Sunday law. The door closes. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has already begun. The judgments of God are now up on the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. The sealing is a settling into the truth, intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. Please notice that a couple of things in here. It's, a, it's an internal thing. I'm thinking again about Russell this morning. It's, it's about it's something that's going on in our hearts and minds. Some of us uh, in the 1840 to 44 time period, some of those people uh, were only acting upon impulse of feeling. That's, that's what Sister White said. And when the test the step-by-step -step testing that took place in the first, second, third angel's message, including the midnight cry testing that took place, those that were operating on the, the feelings, uh, they ended up on the wrong side of the issue. But those wise virgins that were settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually so that they could not be moved, they were there in the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844. This is, this is repeated again. But the point is this several times, several times, as we're sharing the material, some people get it for the first time. They're hearing it, and they finally get it. They realize, yes, probation's about to close, and it's going to close soon. I remember one time, there was a brother translating, and he'd never translated before, and we were at a very serious point, sharing from the Word of God, from the Spirit of Prophecy, that probation is about to close, and I looked over at the brother, and he couldn't talk anymore, and there was tears running down his face. And he was done. He had to take about an hour break before he could get up and translate again, because it hit him. And over and over again, I've had people come up to me after meetings and say, I get it. Their tears running down their face. 
what do I do? How do I get ready? I'm not ready. It's happened several times. And the reason is, is they get that here at the Sunday Law, it's all over. But this quote here, this makes it even more serious. You know what it's saying? It's saying before the Sunday Law. We have to have a character ready before the Sunday Law. It's more serious than simply the Sunday Law being the dividing line. We have to be ready today. It's serious. It's serious, and it's a settling into the truth, and the Lord is going to be the one that empowers us to stand in that time. This is all the Lord. This is all the Lord. The people that are sealed, they are the representatives of Christ's character on planet Earth. They are standing for the Lord, and He is timing the test with their growth. He's waiting for those that are going to stand during this time to get fully settled into the truth. And when they are, then the test comes. We have to have that experience before the test. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then... The latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples upon the day of Pentecost. Brothers and sisters, one of the things she's saying there is, is that first, those that are going to receive the seal of God, receive the seal of God, and then the latter rain falls upon them. When do we receive the seal of God? At the Sunday law. The latter rain comes after the Sunday law. This is, may seem like a moot point, but it's not. It's not. Now, there is a sprinkling of the latter rain that comes before the Sunday law. You can show that. And you're all familiar with the quote where it says that the Holy Spirit will be poured out among them and it'll be falling on hearts all around them, but they will not discern nor receive it. Receive it. There's a time period when the latter rain is sprinkling out upon the wheat and tares. And the tares will not receive it. They won't even discern that it's happening. But it's not poured out uh, with its full abundance until the church is purified. And what purifies the church? The Sunday law. So I'm not denying that there's a, there's a, I believe Bible prophecy is teaching that we're in the time period of the latter rain right now. I'll just go on record. And I think you can show it from Bible prophecy. It's sprinkling right now. And I, I understand what a bold claim that that is. But I think you can defend it from Bible prophecy. We're in this time period now. And it has to do with uh, the budding of the trees in Luke 21 um, and some other prophetic factors. But let's continue on. What are you doing, brethren, in the great work of preparation? Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. When the decree goes forth, I've actually had people here on this quote, on this very sentence say, how can you know what decree that's talking about? And I say, you know what? Read the spirit of prophecy. This is the vaguest place where in the spirit of prophecy on what that decree is. I mean, this is the Sunday Law decree, but this is the, the least informative of the other, I think it's 18 times that Sister White uses the decree. 18 or 19. All the other times, she's very specific that it's the Sunday Law decree. So if she says something 18 or 19 times, and in this place here, you have to assume when she says decree, she's talking about the Sunday Law decree, when the Sunday law decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. Whose will? Those that are sealed. Their character is pure forever. So what does that mean? That means probation closed. And that's what we're defining the close of probation as. From this point on, this is the, the text where we're trying to define what we mean in this study by the close of probation. When we reach the point in time of Seventh-day Adventists that our character is fixed for eternity, either for or against God, 
That's what we're talking about. The fixation of our character one way or another for eternity, that's the close of probation. I know our, my probation closes if I fall over dead right now. That's not what we're talking about in this study. We're talking about this time period where our character is fixed forever. Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the foreheads of an impure woman, impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the foreheads of an ambitious world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women of false tongues and deceitful hearts. All who receive the seal must be without spot before God, candidates for heaven. Go forward, my brethren and sisters. I can only write briefly upon these points at this time, merely calling your attention to the necessity of preparation. Search the scriptures for yourself, that you may understand the fearful solemnity of the present hour. So now that we've defined some of, some of the issues of the close of probation, the purification of God's church, let's try to start dealing with some waymarks. We're almost done with this presentation, but we can, we can deal with one of them. God has revealed what is to take place in these last days, that his people may be prepared to stand against the tempests of opposition and wrath. Those who have been warned of the events before them are not to sit in calm expectation of the coming storm, comforting themselves that the Lord will shelter his faithful ones in the day of trouble. We are to be as men waiting for their Lord, not in idle expectancy, but in earnest work and with unwavering faith. It is no time now to allow our minds to be engrossed with the things of minor importance. While men are sleeping, Satan is actively arranging matters so that the Lord's people may not have mercy or justice. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many with, who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent has tending. Its professions are mild and apparently Christians, but when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. It is our duty to do all in our power to avert the threatened danger. We should endeavor to disarm prejudice by placing ourselves in a proper light before the people. We should bring before them the real question at issue, that thus interposing the most effectual protest against measures to restrict liberty of conscience. We should search the scriptures and be able to give the reason for our faith. Says the prophet, the wicked should do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Who's the wise? This is the wise virgins, but where, where are these wise virgins located in scripture? Daniel 12, Daniel's last vision. Daniel, this has something to do with the book of Daniel, but the one way Mark will put down in closing is that the Sunday movement, before the Sunday movement, it's going forward in darkness. And brothers and sisters, we may not hear about a Sunday law being argued about with George Bush in the Congress right now, but based on inspiration, the movement's going forward as we speak. It's in darkness. It's going to come out of the closet soon enough. It's going to come out of the closet when Satan knows he has all his ducks in a row. And the way I look at the, the political makeup and the religious makeup of the United States today, the ducks are pretty much in a row. The only thing left is for God's people to settle into the truth spiritually and intellectually so that they cannot be moved. And then it's coming. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light that you've given us in this dark time and in this dark world. Help us be fit reflectors of this light for those around us that they can awaken to the issues and their personal needs and have time to prepare. Lord, we want to be among those that receive the seal. And we ask that if we've been walking the path of worldliness and weakness, that you would turn us into the path of growing strength. We want to be among those that help finish this work, that we might go home with you soon, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.